Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Welcome back. Um, hope you've had a good break. Hope you've had a chance to connect and do some networking, whether that's in the room or, or online or possibly both, if you're feeling very keen. Just want to remind you about the hashtag, um, hashtag UKCFC. Um, and if you're submitting a question online, just remember to mention, ideally, if you can, which speaker it's directed to. Okay, so um, this session, research for today, uh, we'll cover how the trust is investing in research to ensure that people stay as well as they can in the short term. So we're going to hear some updates on the latest advances in managing and treating symptoms and complications for people with CF um, from trust-funded strategic research centres and the Venture and Innovation Awards. So I'd like to start by introducing Professor James Shaw from the Newca University of Newcastle and his presentation, CF Related Diabetes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here in person, and it's great to see everyone online, too. And it's lovely for me to have the opportunity to say thanks to the CF Trust, who've been wonderfully supportive of our work, uh, as you'll hear, I hope. I'm talking about cystic fibrosis-related diabetes. As you know now, the most common comorbidity in CF, affecting 20% of adolescents, and probably at least 40 or 50% of adults. What's interesting right at the outset is that if pancreatic exocrine function is normal, digestive juice function, insulin secretory fa uh, function also remains normal. As you know, high glucose levels may not be associated with symptoms. And increasingly, we've just been talking about having early access to Libra in the UK. And often that's how diabetes is picked up before glucose tolerance tests. So I was lucky enough uh, back in 2016 to be for, uh, supported by a strategic research center. And it's a really a wonderful mechanism of funding, bringing together scientists, particularly early career researchers, for fantastically integrated science. And one of the things we found in that first SRC done by Michael White was looking for the location of CFTR in pancreas. And you can see here in pink, islets flagged up by chromogranin staining, and how in situ hybridization for CFTR is excluded from the islets. So expressed in the exocrine pancreas, but not in the islets. And we saw exactly the same thing at a protein level. So that led to our proposal for the second CF strategic research center, now moving from preclinical science to more translational science, to look at the mechanisms and measures through which exocrine pancreatic disease might be mediating failure of the beta cell and diabetes. And this was an even broader collaborative effort, as you can see some of the centers uh, on this slide. Particularly wonderful was meeting up with Daniel uh, Forhalt Jepsen and he finding out about this incredible cohort that he's studying in Copenhagen for many years, including detailed glucose tolerance tests in 2017. And his researcher, Bibi, has worked incredibly hard to do extended glucose tolerance tests in this cohort of nearly 100 participants in 2020. And she's just about to complete the second OGTT analysis following triple therapy. Here's some of the findings in that first cohort in 2020. Nearly 100 participants split equally into the four groups of glucose tolerance. So you can see in yellow when glucose tolerance goes into the diabetic range, and then in green, impaired glucose tolerance, and then normal glucose levels as you go down to normal glucose tolerance. If we look at C now, you can see that insulin is clearly lower insulin secretion in those with CF-related diabetes. But interestingly, impaired glucose tolerance, what you're seeing is much more a delayed peak rather than a complete reduction in total insulin secretion. Exactly the same with C-peptide in panel D. We're also interested, this is a glucose tolerance test, not a meal tolerance test, how glucagon was secreted in response to that challenge, this aberrant alpha cell function, and particularly noted that in those with impaired glucose tolerance. We also looked at beta cell pro-insulin processing by measuring pro-insulin in the blood. And if you look at panel B, you can see how, not surprisingly, when C-peptide is, is lower, 
that you see as a ratio more pro-insulin. But if we go back to panel A, you can see that the highest absolute pro-insulin secretion was occurring in the impaired glucose tolerance test group. So this led to a new hypothesis where highest pro-insulin secretion is suggesting a phenotypic shift in the beta cell, perhaps due to redu reduced pro-hormone convertase expression, but this is paralleled by higher glucose-induced glucagon secretion, suggesting that there's a link between stressed alpha and beta cells in the process of CF in the pancreas. Now, BB is currently in the US, in Pennsylvania, doing a much deeper mathematical modeling of beta cell and alpha cell function, and then trying to see how the two are linked with each other. We wanted to triangulate beyond our metabolic tests because clearly we can't access the pancreas with biopsies in people with cystic fibrosis. So we wanted to look at can we image the pancreas? And Kieran Hollingsworth in Newcastle has done wonderful work in type 2 diabetes looking at pancreatic changes with weight loss. Uh, many of you will know about those studies. And you can see in this figure how he can measure the size and shape of pancreas in A and B, measure the duct in panel C, but more subtly begin to look for inflammation and fibrosis in the pancreas, in addition to fat replacement, not shown in this figure. And the other part of triangulation was what can we measure in the blood beyond the beta cell function? Can we measure inflammatory markers? And we decided to focus on extracellular vesicles, particularly exosomes. And Schaffer Waters, shown here in this slide, is really leading this work in CF in Australia. And looking at these envelopes that are pinched off the cells and carry microRNAs, proteins, and other signaling molecules. And we hypothesize that they carry them from the X crime pancreas to the beta cell, but that we can collect the envelopes in the blood, spin them down, and try and get a window on what's happening at a local level in the pancreas. So MR scans are now well underway in the CF cohort in Copenhagen. Very interestingly, some of these participants are really young in their, in their teens, and yet BB is virtually ubiquitously seeing very little pancreas, a really atrophic organ, particularly in everyone who has exocrine insufficiency. So that's interesting, isn't it? It's looking very burnt out. And yet, many of these people have normal insulin secretion. So there must be something downstream of that damage that's allowing the islets still to work and potentially to be rescued when they stop working. So she's now looking at quantitative meth methods to try and understand what's left in the little bit of the pancreas that she can image. The exosome proteome uh, extraction is complete from all of these 93 participants, and we've got samples stored from the 2017 uh, GTTs as well. Biomarkers certainly are differentially expressed with glycemic status from normal glucose tolerance through to CF diabetes. And um, at the moment, Schaffer is really working down onto the microRNOME uh, to look at analysis of that and potential biomarkers. And I should mention that in Sweden, they're looking at um, total microRNA circulation and sequencing of that has just been completed. So I said we couldn't see the tissue in CF, but we're very fortunate again in linking up with Professor Gunter Kleppel, really the, the leader uh, of CF and indeed pancreatic pathology over many, many years. And he's provided us with a unique post-mortem repository of CF pancreas. It doesn't project that well here, but in the middle of each of these um, microscopy slides, you, there are lots of islets. So everything else around them is destroyed, and yet the islets are still there. And what does show on the slide is that in one of them, you can see they're encased in fibrosis, whereas in the other one, they're really surrounded by fat cells. So we're lucky also in working with Sarah Richardson and these fantastic two medical students at the bottom, Matthew and Lydia, who've been using AI to look at fibrosis and many other markers in the pancreas and to quantify this. 
and not just to quantify where the fibrosis is over the whole pancreatic section, but to home in on the islets and to look for fibrosis within the islets, measuring collagen distribution and density on a serious red stain with recoding by AI, and then looking at a little 30 micron halo around the islets for fibrosis. Yara in my group, PhD student, is also looking at that fibrosis in all of the CF cohort, but beginning to look at the potential mediators of that fibrosis. And these are activated fibroblasts expressing alpha smooth muscle actin, and you can see them localized uh, in the brown IHC staining around islets in the CF cohort. Nicole Katner, working in my group and supervising Yara, is looking at the islets and what's changing in these CF islets. They're there, beta cells are there, as you can see here from positive insulin staining, the nice bright red insulin staining. But interestingly, these cells, these alpha and beta cells, are expressing markers that should not be seen in those cells. And we're looking here at Vimentin, expressed very much in an endocrine phenotype, as you can see by the co-localization of the green and purple staining. And the purple is staining for glucagon. So again, we're going back to thinking, well, the alpha cell seems to be changing in this disease, as well as the beta cell. The other model that we've established is taking human islets, not from people with cystic fibrosis, but normal human islets and culturing them in 2D in vitro. And very rapidly we see an outgrowth of fibroblasts and a proliferation of fibroblasts which are activated. So we're excited about this as a model to begin to look at fibroblast activation and how this may be affecting beta cell function. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're collecting the secretome from these uh, cultures over time as the fibroblasts become activated and we're incubating that on beta cell lines primarily to look at decreased beta cell function. When we see that, we'll then undertake full analysis of these samples to understand what signaling molecules are coming from activated fibroblasts and what signaling molecules are we seeing from the islets. And we've already undertaken RNA sequencing with another uh, collaborator, Nicole Krentz in Stanford, of these samples and beginning to look at the uh, pathway analysis of that. And in parallel, we'll be doing proteomic analysis. In addition to the secretome studies, we're setting up co-cultures of the activated fibroblasts with beta cells and then islets. Finally, uh, I'm going through an awful lot here. I know it's a busy, uh, a busy, busy morning. Um, Lena Eliasson, who was part of our first SRC, and a PhD student of hers, Ephraim, is looking at some candidate markers that may be signaling these changes in beta cell function. And John Engelhart, who is known to many of you, worked with us on the first SRC and has a fantastic ferret model of CFTR and indeed CFRD. And in this, he looked at TGF beta secretion from uh, ductal cells and then came up with a new candidate marker of IGF-BP7 being secreted from activated fibroblasts. Now this is in the ferret model. So what Lena and her team have done is to take IGF-BP7 and to add this to a challenge study on human beta cells and to see a decreased response in terms of glucose-stimulated insulin secretion just by adding it into that short-term stimulation test. And then in parallel, the team incubated human beta cells with IGF-BP7 for 72 hours. And again, as you can see on the right, saw a decrease in glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And they're already beginning to see parallel changes in the phenotype of these beta cells, for example, transcription factor expression changes. So to summarize, this is a very integrated SRC, and we're really learning from each other. Detailed metabolic analysis of a large, really well-defined cohort with CF has revealed abnormal alpha cell function in patients, as well as abnormal beta cell insulin processing. 
exosomal and microRNA analysis is underway to identify putative exocrine mediators of this. Reassessment following 12 months CAF trio is nearing completion. Aberrant alpha cell phenotype has been identified at a tissue level within CF post-mortem samples, and this is spatially associated with peri islet fibrosis. I didn't really have time to say that, but when the fibrosis around the islets, that's associated with abnormal alpha cell phenotype, and Nicole's presenting this at the ADA very soon. Activated pancreatic fibroblasts have been established in primary culture, and the impact of their secretome and indeed candidate molecules on beta cell phenotype and function is being studied in two centers. What are we going to do next? Once we've identified the signaling molecules in vitro, and we know that they're pancreatic in origin, we can go back to the blood samples and analyze the, the uh, candidate markers there, looking at correlations with phenotype. In parallel with that, we'll go back to the tissue and undertake spatial phenotyping for these novel markers. And it just remains for me to say that all the work was done by the scientists I've shown you today, and I just have the pleasure of standing up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, so our next speaker is Paul McNally, RSCI, University of Medicine and Health Sciences. And he's gonna be presenting an update on the Recover study, real world effects of CAFTRIO. Paul's joining us remotely, and I'm just waiting. I want to make sure that he can hear us. Hi, Paul. Can you hear us okay? He's uh, sitting I can, yeah. There. Yep. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. That's fine. You seem to be a bit frozen on the screen, but I think we've got you. Um, so, uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Emil. Uh, I'm sorry to be um, doing this remotely. Uh, sorry, I'm going to turn my it's audio down a bit so I can hear myself. Um, uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. I'm speaking at another conference in Dublin. Um, uh, so, listen, thanks a million for allowing me or inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm very excited to be able to update you on the Recover study. Um, so, Recover is a, a multi center study that's happening in the UK and Ireland. Um, sorry, here's my disclosure just before I start, including funding from the uh, CF Trust. So uh, RECOVER is a multi-centre study in the UK and Ireland, uh, so uh, eight centres overall, uh, including one in uh, London, in the Brompton, and uh, two in Belfast. Uh, and so, um, you know, in 12 minutes, uh, I could speak for six 12-minute talks uh, on RECOVER, but I'll, I'll go through it reasonably quickly in terms of what we're looking at, so I can get to some of the results. So uh, we have a range of pulmonary and non-pulmonary uh, endpoints. So obviously we're looking at FEV1 as it's collected clinically. We're looking at lung clearance index uh, via nitrogen multiple breath washout. And uh, Jane Davies and her team in uh, the Brompton are uh, leading this. We're also looking at spirometric control CT and harm in uh, Rotterdam uh, is, uh, is leading this aspect of it uh, with the new lung analysis team. And so all of the uh, CT scanners and all of the centers were standardized uh, and all the, um, the data has been scored via the uh, Pragma, which is a, a newly developed score. Uh, we're also looking at exhaled nitric oxide and the metabolome, uh, exacerbations requiring IVs, uh, oral antibiotic use through pharmacy pickups, uh, and then microbiology through the clinical labs and also uh, lung inflammation then or airway inflammation through uh, with our colleagues in Belfast. So outside of the lungs then, uh, we are looking at uh, abdominal symptoms, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a while. Uh, nutritional indices collected as part of routine care. Uh, we're looking at uh, gut inflammation through fecal calprotectin and M2PK, uh, and also evidence of exocrine function through the collection of uh, fecal elastase. Uh, we're very interested to see what the use of pancreatic enzymes is uh, with CAFTRIO and uh, whether this reduces and we'll look at this through pharmacy pickups. Uh, we're trying to characterize liver disease changes in liver disease status over time with uh, CAFTRIO. So we do this by ultrasound, uh, blood tests and physical examination. We're measuring sweat chloride annually um, uh, every six months uh, initially. Uh, we're looking at nasal lavage for evidence of infection and inflammation. Uh, we're also looking at ad adherence to all medications through 
uh, direct digital measurement through pharmacy pickup rates and through um, self-report questionnaires. Uh, and we will also be looking at uh, CFQR. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna go straight into the results that we have to date. The, the data that I'm presenting is from the first six months of the study in people 12 and older. So obviously it follows clinical prescription. So uh, we have uh, recruited our six to 11 um, uh, year old children, but we were a year into the data on the 12 and overs. And we're just getting it ready for the European CF meeting. So I'm just going to present the 12 and over data for the first six months. Um, so first of all, this uh, slide just looks at our baseline lung function. So if we start on the right, looking at FEV1, um, we know that the, you know, what's considered the normal range in inverted commas uh, is 80 to 120% uh, predicted. Uh, and you can see that, you know, there's a lot of uh, subjects who are within this range, but then uh, a lot who are below it as well. And I suppose it just goes to show that uh, it's not a very useful test, FEV1, if we're trying to compare people to, uh, to others. Um, because if we look on the left, um, uh, sorry, I should say that on the horizontal axis there, we've all patients, and um, those who were homozygous for F508, Dell, that's FF, and those who were heterozygous for F508 had a minimum function mutation, and that, that's how the groups are separated. On the left then, uh, we look at LCI and the, uh, the, the, uh, the normal range is much more tight for LCI and it, it's unchanging through life. And so a normal range of around 7.5 uh, is uh, uh, illustrated by the gray line. And you can see that despite many people fitting into what would be considered a normal FEV1, uh, almost everybody has an abnormal LCI and uh, it underlines the sensitivity of this test. So um, this is the overall data for all participants, uh, both minimum function and uh, five weight homozygotes. Uh, and so just as an overall snapshot, you can see uh, we found you know, significant improvements in sweat chloride, uh, consistent with what was found in uh, the, the clinical trials, uh, a significant improvement in LCI of about two points and, and uh, one point uh, improvement is around about the um, uh, clinically relevant change. Uh, lung function improvement of 8.6% on average. Uh, just to remember that this is in people who are already on dual combination modulators and a cohort of minimum function mutations who are on nothing. Uh, as, as expected, a significant improvement in weight uh, and BMI, and then also an improvement in exhaled nitric oxide, uh, which is uh, consistent with what was seen with IPACAFTR. Uh, and as a marker of um, airway inflammation. If we look then a little bit closer, and hopefully people can see this uh, at sweat chloride. So I'll just orientate you. I don't want you to look at all the data. I'll bring you through a few slides. Um, so the top part of the table here is F508 uh, del homozygotes, and the bottom part is uh, heterozygotes with a minimum function mutation. And you can see the red boxes uh, are highlighting the sweat chloride. So you can see that the uh, homozygote group started with a lower sweat chloride. Uh, all but one or two of these uh, people were on a dual combination modulator. And the minimum function group started with a much higher sweat chloride. Um, we had a similar reduction uh, of about 40 millimoles in both groups. Uh, and so we ended up with a lower uh, sweat chloride value in the homozygous compared to the minimum function group. And I'll explore this in a little bit more detail in the subsequent slide, but it shows the, um, the, the gene-related effect uh, of the F5 with Dell uh, allele, uh, which is uh, nice to see because it was always something of a, of a disadvantage to have a F5 with Dell allele in the past. If we look at the spread of changes in sweat chloride, then uh, it goes from a very minimal response of uh, 12 millimoles or so up to over 80. So uh, the waterfall plot really shows the, the variability that's there. And it's something that we really need to understand more about. And hopefully through studies the likes of uh, Recover and Promise, we'll be able to understand a little bit more about how and why people respond differently and what that means. So if we look then at the six month sweat chloride uh, values, uh, it tells a very different story whether you're homozygous or heterozygous. For the homozygous group, uh, you can see, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, but for those who mightn't, uh, you know, sweat chloride of greater than 60 is diagnostic. Uh, less than 40 
um, is considered technically normal, but most clinicians would like to see a value less than 30, and 30 or 40 to 60 is in the borderline area. So uh, almost half of people uh, with uh, homozygous for F508L age 12 and over had a normal sweat chloride after six months of Cactrio, uh, which is really quite striking. It's, it's very different though for minimum function mutations, much smaller proportion with a sweat chloride than normal range. And uh, about a third of them still with a sweat chloride that's technically uh, in the abnormal range. Um, so f 5 del at this stage, uh, where we're looking at now is, a, is, is the mutation to have. So we then move to uh, LCI. Um, and uh, you can see even in those on a dual combination modulator, it started on uh, with an LCI of uh, a mean of 11.6, we have a significant improvement in that, uh, and a much more substantial improvement in the minimum function group who were naive to modulator use, and the two groups ending with a reasonably similar LCI despite uh, differences in sweat chloride. Uh, and it'll take a good bit of unpicking to understand this, I think. In terms of lung function then, uh, again, a much more substantial improvement in those who weren't on a modulator beforehand, uh, and the data here not dissimilar to what uh, we would have seen in the, uh, in the clinical trials. So uh, I mentioned the abdominal symptom score. The CF ABT score was developed by Jochen Mainz and his collaborators uh, in uh, Jena, uh, first and, and Jochen's now in Brandenburg. Um, so uh, this was the first time this was used for um, uh, modulators. And, and after a month or so, we already saw uh, a significant improvement in um, uh, the total score and also quality of life, pain and gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, so uh, um, some bits uh, weren't improved like bowel motions and appetite disorders. And we will be presenting the um, uh, repeated uh, um, uh, data at the European CF conference uh, in June. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we're very keen to see that it uh, is sustained uh, improvement. Uh, so in summary then, uh, from what we've seen so far at six months, uh, significant improvement in lung function and LCI, uh, which is a new finding. Um, improved sweat chloride and a definite genotype advantage for those with f 5 uh, But we're not sure of the relevance of this yet. This time will, uh, will tell us this. Uh, and we have a sizable portion of uh, people now, even age 12 and above, with a technically normal sweat chloride, uh, which is fantastic to see. Uh, we also have improved abdominal symptoms. So yeah, there's a lot more data uh, in Recover, and uh, I'll be delighted to come back in future years and uh, uh, fill you in on that. So in terms of the progress, I mean, this is a, a big multicenter study with lots of different endpoints. Uh, and as any of you are involved in these know, it's very tricky. Uh, the drug was approved very quickly during COVID. Um, which we weren't expecting, so it caught us off guard. And, uh, and uh, confusion reigned in terms of whether this was a trial or not. It's a trial in the UK, it's not a trial in Ireland. Uh, and so certainly loads of challenges in terms of trying to run the study across jurisdictions. COVID-19 definitely had an impact on our sampling, particularly sputum sampling, where um, at the start of the pandemic, uh, induced sputum uh, was a no-no. Um, and we've, we've also seen that so many people have dried up completely on Caftrio that we're really struggling to get any sort of samples. Um, and it's been very hard, you know, obviously during COVID, ethics committees and research offices were really prioritizing COVID studies. So it was very hard to get it across the line. Um, so we're now at the stage of completing the one year data collection for the older um, cohort and we've started recruitment for the younger cohort. Uh, and we're planning for a follow on study now because what we want to know really is, although we will see a short-term effect, what are the, what's the duration of the beneficial effects and do they wear off and in whom and uh, in what context? We also are very interested in the natural history in younger children. So children who have not, who have not yet developed irreversible or uh, uh, disease or, or damage, organ damage, uh, and whether we can uh, maintain health and, and can we prevent these disease like bronchiectasis or liver disease or diabetes from happening in these groups? Um, and so ENHANCE is a new study that we're working on at the moment uh, to try and have a, a more longitudinal tail on, on this and also recruit infants from birth. So I'd just like to thank uh, the Recover team. Uh, it's a very big team and particularly um, I want to single out uh, Banat, Carolyn and Caroline who are our 
uh, PPI team have been involved from the very start uh, and been central in ensuring a, a, a relevance to patients. Um, I want to thank the CF Foundation, uh, CF Ireland and the CF Trust for uh, funding as well. Uh, and thank you very much for your attention and um, I'd be delighted to take questions subsequently. Thank you very much, Paul. So I'd now like to introduce Dr. Yu Zhang from the University of Cambridge, and he's going to give his presentation, The Role of CFTR in Macrophage Function. Thank you. Uh, hi, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I work in a Floto family in Cambridge University. And today I would like to share some interesting results regarding the role of CFTR in macrophages. Um, so uh, we all know the CFTR is a kind of ion channel uh, which is uh, transporting the chloride ions and uh, hydrogen uh, carbonate ions. And the current uh, established uh, dogma is um, uh, if there is a dysfunction of uh, epithelial CF CFTR, which is going to lead to the dehydration of airway uh, surface, uh, therefore causing chronic infection and inflammation. Uh, subsequently leading to the lung damage. Uh, however, we think this is not the full picture uh, about it. So uh, since the CFTR is also expressed uh, in macrophages, could CF also cause an immune defect, uh, which may explain susceptibility to micropathogens? Um, so our question really is, is cystic fibrosis a primary immunodeficiency of macrophage function. So in order to do this, to test this, we first took the uh, uh, human, primary human macrophages from uh, say, uh, health volunteers and uh, CF patients. We can compare the killing ability, uh, pathogen killing ability of those uh, macrophages. Uh, as you can see here, uh, there's the reduced kissing, killing ability uh, from the CF patient samples compared to healthy uh, volunteers. And such a uh, deficiency can be rescued by treating the patient, uh, treating the samples with Evacaptor. And then we uh, took the blood samples from uh, CF patients again, and we uh, use reprogramming factors to generate some uh, 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 stem cell lines and we use genetic uh, Cas CRISPR-Cas9 method to genetically uh, modify the uh, CFTR protein, uh, either in single allele or both. Uh, we managed to partially rescue the killing uh, function of the macrophages. So as you can see here, uh, it works both well for the axoris and the pseudomonas. And it's the same story for abscesses. We also find that uh, uh, the inflammatory, inflammatory re response also reduced. Uh, as you can see here, the TNF alpha signal uh, reduced significantly. Um, uh, we next, we uh, interestingly, we took some uh, wet type uh, uh, macrophages, and we use CRISPR Cas9 knock in uh, produce the. F508 del homozygous uh, cell line, and uh, it shows uh, uh, reduced uh, killing ability, uh, which in line with our previous findings. And such uh, reduced killing ability can be rescued by treating with uh, calf trial. So then, uh, interestingly, we use a, a zebrafish model, and we found similar uh, results. Basically, as you can see here, uh, when, they, when we treat the uh, zebrafish with uh, as always, and uh, they knock out and knock down uh, CFTR zebrafish model shows a reduced survival rate, uh, as well as uh, uh, reduced killing ability. Um, now we're trying to understand what could be the underlying mechanism. And uh, here we show that actually uh, compared to the wild-type THP1s, uh, this 5FO8 uh, del, uh, del homozygous -like cell line showed uh, reduced uh, calcium influx and the ROS production 
uh, in response to the stimulus. And uh, it's the same story for the primary human macrophages uh, phages we took from CF uh, patients and the human uh, volunteer, healthy volunteers. Uh, then we tested uh, some real infections uh, of, of the common pathogens. Uh, this is an example of the SRS, which is labeled in red. And uh, the green shows the calcium uh, sensor, and ROS, uh, the blue shows the ROS indicator. And we managed to quantify uh, the results, and it shows the same story. Uh, there's a both reduction of uh, uh, calcium influx as well as ROS production. And it's the same, uh, interesting for the CF uh, fish model, uh, it shows uh, as well the redu reduction of the ROS production as well as impaired calcium signaling. Uh, we considering the CF uh, TR is a kind of ion channel, we further tested uh, uh, the membrane voltage of these uh, cell lines, uh, either through the whole cell patch recording and the one, uh, we generate a kind of uh, uh, voltage sensor indicator cell lines to monitor the population uh, membrane voltage. Uh, here, as you, you can see here, there's a uh, depolarization of the membrane voltage uh, in the F508 uh, homozygous cell lines compared to the uh, wild type ones. So now we think we understand well the mechanism. Can we do something about the phenotypes uh, we found. So uh, we try to modify the ion uh, driving force uh, externally. Uh, as you can see here, uh, we, if we use high chloride uh, concentrations externally, we can turn the wild type uh, cell lines, uh, the phenotype from the wild type cell lines into uh, the CF uh, phenotype. And uh, however, if we increase the calcium concentration, uh, concentrations, we can manage to rescue partially the <coughs> function. And uh, we also tested the uh, function of the macrophages uh, by testing the bacterial killing ability. And uh, by increasing the external calcium concentrations, we managed to res uh, restore the function of the macrophages. Uh, uh, Interesting. if we increase the potassium concentrations extracellularly, we can convert the wild type one into a kind of a disease phenotype. So here's our summary. Basically, we found that the CFTR uh, dysfunction have direct effect on macrophage function, and the CF macrophages fail to kill pathogenic bacteria because they can't produce uh, superoxide properly. And I hope I can convince you that uh, uh, the membrane depolarization in the CF leads to reduction uh, of uh, calcium influx as well as uh, reduced ROS production, uh, therefore leading to the less bacterial killing. And uh, our findings uh, potentially uh, f uh, support the implications for the risk uh, stratif stratification and therapy for CFTR heterozygous and other conditions with macrophage dysfunction. And uh, here, finally, in the end, this is our working model. So we found that uh, there's a dysfunction of the CFTR in the macrophages, and that's going to lead to the membrane uh, depolarization, therefore causing decreased uh, calcium influx, uh, subsequently, uh, subsequently leading to decreased ROS production. Uh, uh, causing the decreased bacterial killing ability. So in the end, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Andrews providing the platform uh, for this uh, fascinating project. And uh, Karen did all the uh, bacterial killing ability assay. And uh, Ludwig and Caro uh, uh, offered the stem cell uh, supporting. And Steve uh, Audrey provides the zebrafish model, and Patrick and Lucia uh, offered us the genetic uh, F508 genetic knocking cell line. Uh, of course, uh, and we are also grateful for the patients and staff of the Adult CF Center. And this project is funded by uh, CF Fibrosis Trust.
and welcome to us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, you. Um, so I'd like to introduce our final speaker for this session, Dr. Daniel Neal from the University of Liverpool, who's presenting on PIPE CF, an evidence-based preclinical framework for the development of antimicrobial therapeutics in CF. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the CF Trust for the invitation to speak. Uh, I'm here really on behalf of a much bigger team, uh, part of the PIPE CF, CF Strategic Research Centre. Uh, and we're just getting underway, really. So I'm not going to present much data in this talk. Instead, I'm going to give you an overview of the challenges that we are trying to address and our approach to addressing those. So I don't think I need to tell anyone in this audience that antimicrobial development is a long, uh, complicated, and expensive process. So anywhere upwards of a decade to bring a, a new drug to market. It's also a, a very multidisciplinary um, pipeline to work through. So of course we need basic understanding of the biology of infection. We need to work with medicinal chemists to, to refine um, drug action. And of course we need the input from people who understand pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. So it's usually large teams working on these challenges. It involves a lot of resource. Um, and even for a very simple condition, developing a new drug is, is complicated. For something like a cystic fibrosis lung infection, there are added layers of complexity from the, the complexity of the infection environment itself. So the, the motivation for, for this project really came out of work um, done by the, the CF syndicate in AMR um, that, that Bev and Paula introduced this morning. Um, so they did some work canvassing academics, clinicians, um, SMEs and CROs just to see what were the, the challenges that people were facing when trying to, to develop novel antimicrobial agents for use in CF. Uh, and these five uh, themes came out of that, really. The first is, how do we decide what's an appropriate um, bacterial strain choice for testing? So if we take Pseudomonas aeruginosa as an example, some of the best characterized strains out there are actually not from CF, but from, from other conditions. Should we be using those, or should we, we be using strains that are adapted to the CF environment, or, or a combination of the two? Um, we know that infection in the CF lung is often polymicrobial, um, and the, the biofilm assays that are out there are not very well standardized. Different labs are using different types of assays, and it's not always clear which, which is the, the most appropriate for, for screening our novel drugs. Uh, the, the same thing for the, for the polymicrobial environment. So which species should we be co-culturing in our polymicrobial models? Again, there are lots of different um, models out there. Um, lots of which have uh, excellent utility for, for asking different research questions, but it's not always apparent which might be the most appropriate for, for screening drugs. In vivo models is, is a challenge, I think, for, for developing drugs in, in any space, but I think particularly so um, when we think about CF lung infections. There are a number of different uh, in vivo models out there. The rodent models, of course, are probably the most widely used, but none of these really capture the, the pathophysiology of, of cystic fibrosis. Uh, and lastly, and a point I'll return to, is the landscape of drug discovery is changing. So we're no longer uh, thinking only about direct acting small molecules, but lots of other alternative approaches to, to dealing with infection. So if I can just return to this point about creating um, testing environments that are relevant to CF. So if we think about the kind of basic high throughput screening tools that you might use to identify a novel antimicrobial agent, uh, so on the left-hand side of this figure, you can see you've got a, a culture well, you've got some perhaps nutrient broth in there, and then you add your drug and see if that drug will kill, kill the pathogen. And in this example, you've got a, a clonal population, so a single strain of, of a bacterial species. If we think about CF, that the situation, or the CF lung, the, the situation is very different. So for a start, your bacterial population will not be clonal. You've probably got genetic diversity. Those bacteria might be going in a biofilm. The biofilm acts as a barrier to, uh, for the drug to reach the pathogen. There are lots of other co-colonizing microbes, so bacteria, viruses, fungi. There's mucus, again, another barrier, uh, potentially preventing the drug from accessing the pathogen in the first place. There are lots of antimicrobial peptides and enzymes um, in, in that milieu. And of course, you've got the impact of the, the host environment itself, so that the, the, t the the host tissue and the immune cells that are infiltrating. And all of these things are important. Uh, and if we screen drugs under 
conditions that are not relevant to the actual infection that we're, that we're aiming to treat, then we're not going to get um, good efficacy data. And we know environmental conditions are really important when uh, in, in terms of antimicrobial resistance in bacterial pathogens. So this figure is taken from uh, a review on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but it equally applies to, to other bacterial pathogens, the CF lung. Antimicrobial resistance is multifactorial. So we, we can classify resistance mechanisms as being innate, so something that um, uh, is inherent to the pathogen's biology. Of course, there's acquired resistance through, through mutation, mutation or horizontal gene transfer. But importantly, for what I was just talking about, there are also a number of adaptive uh, resistance mechanisms. So these are things that are switched on or off depending on the environmental conditions that the bacterium finds itself in. So if we're testing a drug in an environment that isn't switching on those adaptive resistance mechanisms that we know are on in, in the CF lung, then we're, we're not going to get accurate data. And I said earlier I'd return to this point about the need for flexible antimicrobial development pipelines. That's because the types of drugs that, that people are developing now are, are, are broadening in, in their scope. So this uh, nice figure is from a review that's not specifically about CF antimicrobials, um, but I think this applies equally to the, to the CF space. So although a lot of money is still going into those direct acting small molecules, we're also starting to see increasing investment in other approaches. So that might be potentiator or adjuvant agents to be used alongside the antimicrobials, uh, pro approaches that target the immune system, so either antibodies or, or vaccines or immune modulators, and then other mechanisms of targeting the bacteria that might not be directly antimicrobial, so things like antivirulence approaches. And you can see fairly easily here, I suppose, that the, that the type of model you would use to screen for the drug depends on the type of drug you're trying to develop. So to, to screen for something that's directly killing your bacteria versus something that's altering its virulence requires a different approach and a flexible approach. Which brings me to, to, to the aims of the SRC. So the overall aim really is to accelerate um, discovery and development of, of novel anti-infectives for, for use in CF, particularly in chronic lung infection. Um, and we're going to do this by addressing five sp more specific aims. So first of all, um, we're going to look to try and make some recommendations on strain choice for, for some of the um, uh, keystone CF pathogens, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, some of the Burkholderia complex, and uh, NTM. Um, particularly for, for Pseudomonas, uh, that work's been, been led largely by um, Esh Mahendralingam in, in Cardiff, uh, in collaboration again with the CF syndicate in, in AMR. We also want to, to look at developing those model systems that we think are capturing those relevant environmental um, aspects of the CF lung environment. And we want to try and benchmark those systems to help others in choosing which might be the most appropriate tool for them for the, for the given agent that they might be trying to develop. An important aspect will be cross-validation of models across different sites. So I think any of us who have, who have worked in research labs know that you know, often a new model will come out, you read about it, you think it's fantastic, you want to set it up in your own lab, and then you get a completely different set of results. Uh, and we need to understand why those problems occur and how we can minimize them. Uh, and I guess the biggest output from this will be we want to generate a set of open access guidelines and resources that can be used by others in academia or in industry. Um, recommendations and standing operating procedures and the like to help lower the barriers of entry for people uh, to get into the um, drug discovery and development space. So we've got um, seven work packages. I'm not going to have time to, to, to go through all of them, but I've, I've already mentioned that we want to define st strain panels. Then we've got three complementary work packages focusing on Pseudomonas aeruginosa, one looking at polymicrobial biofilm models, one looking at the influence of the host environment, so um, models that take account of both the, the host and, and the pathogen. So that could be cell lines or in vivo models. And we've got some work on pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And then work package six will look at adapting some of these models for, for use with species other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And kind of cross-cutting all of this, we've got a, 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 a non-biased approach to model validation. Uh, and of course, the outputs will be those open access resources. So if you think about a standard um, drug development pipeline, then, then usually the approach would be to, to move from something simplistic and high throughput. So that might be screening in, in multi-well plates in a fairly simple um, chemical uh, environment, something like either nutrient broth or, or for CF. Often it would be the sputum mimics. Then as you start to narrow down your, your potential hit compounds, you move into things like the biofilm models and cell line models. 
and finally in a preclinical phase in, in, in the in vivo models, so invertebrate and, and vertebrate infection models. As you move along that, that pipeline, your cost per screen increases dramatically and your ability to do things in a high throughput fashion decreases. Uh, and I suppose that the assumption would be that as you move along the, the pathway, the relevance of the model system you're using increases. Okay, so, so mice are a better model than sputum mimics, for example. But, it, but, but often that is an assumption rather than something that, that's been demonstrated. So part of, part of our, uh, our aim here will be to properly validate these models. And, and for this, we'll be leaning heavily on uh, an approach developed by Marvin Whiteley's lab at, in Georgia Tech in the States, who's, who's part of the SRC. And he's developed this quantitative framework for, for looking at model relevance for, for CF lung infection. And, and it essentially, it works by looking at the pattern of microbial gene expression in any given environment and comparing it to our gold standard, um, which, which would be the expression of bacterial genes in sputum um, collected directly from, from people with CF. So in this uh, figure on the left-hand side here, this is just some principal component analysis of um, RNA sequencing data, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you can see that cluster of kind of blue and, and teal there are the sputum samples, or the expression of pseudomonas genes in sputum samples. And then in red and orange, we've got some of those models. So in vitro models in red and, and some mouse models in orange. And you could perhaps say from that that the, uh, the mouse model is slightly better than the in vitro model, but certainly not by much. And what's more clear is that they all cluster well away from the actual sputum sample uh, data itself. So clearly, there's work to be done to improve the relevance of these models. For the host pathogen models, there's the additional consideration of are we capturing relative aspects of the host response in terms of inflammatory and immune signaling. So as I said, I'm, I'm just one of, one of many. We've got a really great multidisciplinary team. Um, some of uh, the people who are part of the SRC are in this audience. Uh, I'll know a lot more uh, are there online. Um, so we are, we're, we're led by Joe Fothergill uh, here at the top, who I'm uh, acting as a, a poor stand-in for today. Um, but we have partners across, across the UK and, and North America. And actually, probably most importantly, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our PhD uh, cohort that we have on PipeCF. These are uh, our four students have all started in the last month, uh, and they're all attending the meeting either here uh, in person or else online. So I'd encourage you to seek them out. I'm sure they'd be happy to chat about their projects. So we have um, Holly and Tom, who are working uh, with Joe and I in Liverpool, um, Brogan down in Nottingham, and Lucille, uh, who will be spending her time in Cardiff and Cambridge. A uh, fantastic group of really highly motivated students, and I'm hoping either Joe or I or one of the other members of the team will be able to come back in a few years to this meeting and present some of, some of the outcomes. Um, so I'll just thank, thank the team. Um, our SRC is co-funded by the, the CF Trust and the CFF, uh, and we're also very grateful to the CF Syndicate and to the Medicines Discovery Catapult for, for all the help they've put in putting this bid together. Thank you. There. Thanks very much, Daniel. So we've got a, we've got a short um, slot for some questions. Uh, so I'd like to invite our speakers up to the stage. And um, Paul, I'm hoping that you can hear me and we'll see you on screen um, in a moment. OK, so um, this time I'm going to start with questions in the room. So if you can put your hand up and make sure that you say who your question is directed to. And then um, Paul is going to be checking questions for our online delegates. So, um, we got the roving mic. We'll bring it straight to you in the middle here. Thank you. So um, my question is for Dr. Yu. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, I've read some papers on um, Staph aureus use in secretion systems to internalize itself within uh, macrophages. And I was wondering if you saw that in your uh, zebra fish model and if there was a higher number of cells co-localize themselves with macrophages or internalize themselves with macrophages in the CF cells versus the healthy volunteers? Uh, uh, no, I don't think we saw a similar thing like this. Um, uh, I think um, for the zebrafish model, we didn't see that either. OK, thank you. So um, Paul, did we have a question from our online audience? So, Paul, did you hear that? Uh, just about uh, how we're 
uh, children aged six to eleven being recruited and what's the expected cohort size? Yeah. Uh, so the recruitment is happening at the individual study sites. Uh, in the UK, it's active in Belfast and the Brompton, and then in the Irish sites at the, the pediatric sites. Uh, we're not recruiting outside of those sites because it's just an observational study. So we're hoping to get up to about 100 children aged 6 to 11 across all of the centres. Um, it's been a little bit slow. Um, and uh, we have a particular issue in Ireland with approval for the minimum function group. Uh, that's a little bit delayed. Um, so was there a specific question as follow up to that, I wonder? No. no, that's great. Thank you. So back to the room. I think we've got time for another question just down here. Thank you. Hi, another question for you, Zhang. Should we be using azithromycin at all, given the evidence you've just given about macrophage dysfunction in CF? Sorry, again. Sorry, should we be using azithromycin at all, given the evidence you've just uh, given about CFTR causing macrophage dysfunction? Um, that's a very good question. I don't think we did that yet. Yeah, but uh, that's definitely. Uh, under our plan. I've got another really cheeky question. Um, this is this is to James Shaw this time. Should we be using antifibrotics instead, Ben, for my pancreatic insufficient patients who are just waiting to get their diabetes? That is such a great question. We were just talking about it in the break beforehand. Um, I think it's really interesting, definitely. Um, I'm more moving in that direction. I thought coming into this project that we'd be more interested in those drugs in non-CF pancreatitis type 3C diabetes. Yeah, I'm really interested in it. And I think, uh, yeah, you heard the talk. That's the direction that we're moving in. And we've got a number of candidates. As you know, there's two licensed antifibrotics. So I think we'll be testing those in the in vitro model pretty soon. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. So I don't think any more questions have come through from online. We're going to need to wrap up for lunch. I know you had your hand up. Do you, have you got a quick question, Marguerite? I think it's great. Also a question to James. I saw that you had this Vimantine um, sort of overexpression. And as you know, this is a mesenchymal marker. So we have shown that in the respiratory CF cells, there is EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal, uh, transition going on. I wonder whether it's the same, should be the same in pancreatic cells. Yeah, I mean, that was, we went in w very much to look for EMT. And to be honest, when we set up the in vitro model, we were setting it up to model EMT in the endocrine compartment. Um, yes, I think TGF beta 1 signaling is, is going to be very important. Um, our next challenge is to make sure that we can induce beta cell dysfunction rather than making assumptions uh, about, for example, the role of EMT. But yeah, I, it, you could certainly describe it as EMT. Thanks. OK. Listen, I'm really sorry we don't have any more time for questions. Um, I've got a couple of notices before you go to lunch. But I would really encourage you to chat to the speakers over lunch. And if you've got more questions online, we may be able to find a way to filter those through and get the answers back to, to people via the chat. So um, thank you so much to all of our session two speakers for your brilliant presentations.